Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Ron Ackerman. I direct the Institute for Public Health and Medicine at Northwestern University, and I want to welcome you all to today's webinar, part of our series, Translational Applications in Public Health, that we uh, co uh, co-sponsor with the New Cats Institute here at Feinberg. Uh, I want to apologize for the late start today. We had some technical difficulties that usually aren't in, in play, so uh, hopefully everybody will see the presentation both in the room and on the Zoom. Uh, if that's not happening, please uh, let us know. Um, Today, uh, we're honored to have with us Dr. Adam Murphy uh, from the Department of Urology here at Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Murphy is an assistant professor and physician and researcher uh, who's been interested in strategies that identify and address uh, prostate cancer-related health disparities, particularly those affecting HIV-infected men, African-Americans, and Latinx populations. His research is focused on the role of vitamin D deficiency, genetics, and biomarkers in men at high risk or those diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, today, he's with us uh, to share the results of a study, uh, the impact of genomic uh, assay on urologist treatment preference in active surveillance eligible men. Uh, without further delay, I wanna welcome Dr. Adam Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're doing this kind of uh, two computer systems at the same time. So if I'm behind in the slide, someone just shout, advance both. <laughs> Try to be smoother with it. Um, Dr. Adam Murphy, you've heard my introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be here and we'll get started. Um, so two disclosures, uh, this Oncotype DX uh, assay uh, company was marketed differently, and so they asked me to be a consultant uh, uh, to help them market this asset. Uh, and then the other thing is that we're, we are funded by the Department of Defense to expand the cohort that we are presenting about now uh, to its translational science of work. So just quick uh, background, uh, the death rate for a favorable risk prostate cancer varies from 1% in very low risk men to about 9.6% in people who have intermediate risk prostate cancer. Uh, and 6% of people who are eligible for this uh, fairly low risk disease are still getting surgery or radiation, whereas only 40% are getting actively surveilled with repeat biopsies, prostate exams, by the digital rectal exam, and PSA tests. Uh, and so there's potential for overtreatment for this disease because you could safely uh, surveil people because of several clinical trials that have shown that in 10 years, the outcomes of surveillance, surgery, and radiation are about equivalent. So um, these genomic assays have been used to predict aggressive disease, and uh, it can help urologists and patients become more comfortable with the idea of surveilling their tumor and not going with the heuristic of actively treating it up front. And so these assays have been uh, shown to increase the uptake of extra surveillance and physicians act in line with the recommendations at about 83% of cases in kind of retrospective studies. And so the problem with the data is that it, these data did not include higher risk men. And since black men have about a 70% higher risk of getting prostate cancer and twice the mortality rate, even at low risk uh, disease, we wanted to make sure that we adjust that fact. Uh, most of the clinical trial data is from, I'm sorry, the, the cohort data is from uh, Canary Pass or Hopkins or UCSF, places that have uh, really compliant patients in academic medical centers, but have not involved safety net hospitals like the VA or um, county hospitals. And there's no data on actually whether or not these assays help people in terms of their quality of life or in terms of their cancer outcomes. And so um, all the data that we have has been kind of cohort level two, level three data. And so it's never been prospectively uh, tested in a randomized controlled design. Looking at the utility of the assay on both patient and provider treatment preferences. And so we did that. And this was published uh, in 2021 in Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, the primary endpoint was on the urologist treatment preference. 
Uh, and I'm going to update you about that a little bit, but also talk about what happens to actually urologist treatment preferences. Because I believe that urologist treatment preferences are really correlated with patient treatment choice. And so we're kind of the intermediary between the assay and actually what patients choose for their treatment. And so aim one is to measure the effect of the genomic prostate score by Oncotype DX uh, in addition to the usual counseling that happens um, for your treatment choices on the risk, on the likelihood of choosing active surveillance. And then uh, we're for the sub aim of two is to see how, what that does this assay does to the urologist treatment preference. And so uh, we did, we in, recruited 200 men uh, from three sites, Jesse Brown VA, Cook County Health, uh, and University of Illinois at Chicago's hospital. And about 70% of the population was black, which is unusual. 16% of them were college graduates. 46% classified as having low health literacy. And 25% uh, of them were in the higher risk group, uh, favorable intermediate risk. Uh, because we defined the favorable intermediate risk category before the NCCN defined it, there are four people that the NCCN calls unfavorable intermediate risk, uh, but yet everyone else is uh, con consistent with their definition. So we made this definition based off of our urologists' uh, consensus about what would be safe to include in active surveillance. Uh, and we randomized these folks, uh, 104 people had the assay and uh, 96 did not have it. And the primary endpoint was the patient's treatment preference at visit two uh, and the urologist preference uh, right before visit two, before they talked to the patient about the results of the assay to see what the impact of the assay was on the urologist preference without the impact of the patient talking about the assay result. So we'll talk about the layout of the study. So if a person gets a prostate biopsy, oh, you all can't see that, let's see that. Unfortunately, this says biopsy visit, and because you're sharing my screen, you can't see that part of the screen, but the biopsy visit happens about two weeks before they actually come in for their first bio, their first, vi first visit. Uh, to talk about their diagnosis. In most cases, you just talk about your diagnosis, have your treatment counseling, and go on to be treated. In this study, we offered the folks then their, whether they want to be randomized in this trial. And then if they were randomized to the control arm, they would just come back in two weeks and talk about their treatment options. Uh, if they were randomized to the intervention arm, they would get the results of their genomic prostate score, assays, uh, and then have their treatment preferences discussed after the urologist described the results of the assay. And then they would come back two weeks later, or uh, three weeks later for a, a study visit where they got blood draws, and we measured their decision conflict and anxiety, and then they would get treated, and then we would follow them after that treatment visit to see uh, what would happen to them in terms of their treatment outcomes. And we followed them through the electronic health records for about 18 more months. And just so that people understand what the assay looks like, they get this result. It's a two-page piece of paper that's faxed, usually in black and white to most officers. But it, because our coordinators were there, they got color, co color copies of these, uh, these uh, assay reports. And the urologist thought that it was important to highlight three different aspects of this. The first aspect was where they fell along the normal distribution for their risk group. So there was very low risk, low risk, and favorable and immediate risk group. And each one would have their own normal distribution curve. And you would see the, the average for that, that distribution and then where you fell on that distribution. Then you'd also uh, have this, uh, let's say that you came in with, as a low risk group person by your NCCN kind of clinical factors, your PSA, your rectal exam, your biopsy results, how many cores were positive for cancer. That would determine your, your, your risk category. And the company was pretty bold. They would actually move your risk category 
based on whether or not your score was outside the normal, the, the, the interquartile range for your risk group. So if it was higher than your risk group, they would shift you up one or two categories. If it was lower than your risk group, you could be shifted back. So in this example, this low risk man was actually downshifted to very low risk prostate cancer. There wasn't data to say that they should do this in terms of long-term outcomes, but this is what they did. And this was in every version of the report in this trial. Okay, and they also would report your likelihood of having bad pathology or adverse pathology at the time of surgery. So if you had surgery, men like you would have risk of a bad pathologic feature like higher grade tumor, extra capsular extension, or lymph nodes being positive. In this case, in 15% of cases. Okay, so those three factors were highlighted by the urologists. And so for consort, 1,315 patients were analyzed for their diagnostic biopsy. Of those, most people were either no cancer or the cancer was too aggressive to be considered eligible for active surveillance. 317 of those folks were actually eligible and two thirds of them actually were randomized. They, they, they consented to participate. So only 14% of the people that had the biopsies were actually eligible for the study, showing that this is a bit of a high risk population, whereas in general, 50% of people who are bio biopsy diagnosed are eligible for prostate cancer uh, treatment with active surveillance. We did an intention to treat analysis and not an as treated analysis because when people had a failed assay, there was because their tumors were oftentimes too small to do the assay. And we thought that communicated some risk data to the patient. So we kept them, even if they didn't get a result in the arm. And uh, only nine people dropped out for this. Uh, of the 200, nine people dropped out. Four from uh, the uh, uh, control arm and uh, five from the intervention arm. And people were randomized and randomization worked. The only thing that was statistically different between the two arms was that the intervention arm had a higher likelihood of family history of prostate cancer. But everything else that you'd expect to see was well balanced. And so this is what happened with the urologist preference. I'm sorry, with the patient treatment choice. This is what we already published. What you'd expect to see is, here, is accurate. People who had higher risk prostate cancer by their clinical factors had a much lower odds of choosing active surveillance and were more likely to choose surgery or radiation. People who were insured were much more likely, three times more likely to choose active surveillance. We think that's because you need to come back every six months for repeat PSAs, rectal exam results, and then you have to repeat the biopsy every year. And if you didn't have insurance, that'd be hard to do. People who had a family history of prostate cancer were more likely to choose active surveillance. And I believe that's because people who have seen someone go through the side effects of prostate cancer treatment may want to avoid that. And if they can be safely surveilled, why not? But the thing that was most interesting and why we got into general, general clinical oncology probably was this interaction term, which showed that the acid did not have much of an effect in people who had above median or high health literacy. They were both similarly equally likely to choose active surveillance. But if you had low health literacy and you were exposed to the assay, you were seven times less likely to choose active surveillance and more likely to choose surgery or radiation. So low literacy, you get risk data that says you have risk of bad things happening. And now you think I should have surgery or radiation. So I think that could be, a, you know, putting your back of your head, maybe that could overtreat people who have low health literacy. Okay, so this is our urologists. We only had 10 of them. They were spread out across the three institutions pretty evenly. They were racially diverse. The median age was 45 years old. There was, a lot, there was good variance in practice length. Uh, the median number of patients at each enroll was about eight. Uh, and 
7% of them were classified as urologic oncologists. Three were just uro general urologists like myself. Uh, and this is the main outcome of that study. It's just two chi-square tests, which is statistically boring for most folks, but I think it's pretty interesting. Um, the first chi-square test here, uh, I know, general clinical oncology, I did a chi-square test. I feel this is like great. Um, but it shows that at baseline, the, the urologist's baseline preference for active surveillance was e equal across the arm, which is what you'd expect if randomization works. 84% uh, in the intervention arm versus 88% in the control arm. But when you do this after the GPS assay was given, this is right after the urologist had had their initial discussion with the patient just to briefly review their treatment options, tell them what they're about to trial and randomize them. They got the results of the GPS assay right before they went into the room to talk to the patient. So they were given the patient's name, the report showed their NCC and risk group, the results of their uh, PSA and things like that, just basic information. And they were said that this is, what do you choose now? They were not reminded about their treatment choice in the first time. And you can see that once they got the GPS assay, that preference for active surveillance dropped about 15% or 14%. And then it seemed pretty much the same in the control arm. So this p-value becomes statistically significant, suggesting that the assay did have an independent effect to increase the uptake of active, sorry, increase the uptake of active treatments with surgery or radiation. And so this is how I looked in real numbers. Um, this is the control arm. There were only seven changes in decision in the control arm and 21 changes in the intervention arm, three times more changes. And those changes went from active surveillance to active treatment 18 times in the, in the intervention arm versus only five times in the control arm. And when we, we did some modeling to control for other things that could have confounded this association. Uh, in the study arm, we control for their baseline pref preference in this minimally adjusted model. And of course, urologists agree with themselves. We're pretty confident people. So the odds ratio was highest on their baseline preference at visit one. You're, if you all just said active treatment, they were 23 times more likely to choose active treatment again at visit two. But the study arm did statistically matter. And we did a more adjusted model controlling for things that we would expect to uh, matter, like their NCT and risk group, which mattered. Uh, the, their baseline treatment preference mattered. Health literacy mattered. Health literacy mattered in a way that you kind of expect, but I'll just share it. So the higher the patient's health literacy went up, the least likely that they were to choose active treatment and more likely to choose active surveillance. So people with high health literacy, the urologists for those patients more likely chose active surveillance. The urologists did not know the patient's health literacy score. This is just what came statistically significant in the model. But we think that that's true. Like if you have a patient that seems to understand and engages more with you in the conversation about treatment preferences, the more they weigh in to the decision, I believe. Uh, and the more you can have an intellectual conversation about the rigors of active surveillance and how you have to monitor these folks for life every six months. Um, but again, study arm, which, let me see if I can hide this. Study arm here matters. So if you just received, being randomized to the GPS arm increased your likelihood of choosing active treatment, again, three times, even after adjusting for all these factors. Okay, so now you know that the assay itself, just getting the assay, increases the likelihood of getting funneled to active treatment, whether you're the urologist or you're the patient. 
What about the actual results though? Does the results itself matter? Remember they got three pieces of data. They got their GPS score and how it looks on their normal distribution. You also got your shift in GPS. Did your risk go, risk level go up or down with the score? And then you also got this likelihood of uh, adverse pathology. That's so correlated with the actual GPS score itself, we don't test for the adverse pathology part of this. That's, that is just basically a one-to-one -one correlation. So, but this downshift only happens in extreme cases. Uh, and this upshift similarly, and then this, this, we thought that if you were close to average on this distribution, you estimate that people will consider themselves average risk. And in my mind, it would mean that you are likely to be safe to do active surveillance, or at least share that risk with your population. If you were on the lower end of that distribution, maybe you were safer than the average person. And if you were on the higher end, maybe you were riskier and maybe should go towards active treatment more often. And so I tried to show this uh, by looking at people within their NCCN risk group first. Uh, because if you are low risk, we saw that you're li likely to choose active surveillance, whereas if you're intermediate risk, you're likely to choose surgery. And what you find is that, so one more thing, these blue dots, we, it's basically a scatter plot we did here. But because there, it is not a continuous distribution, there's only three options, it looks a little cooler than a scatter plot. And so these blue dots are the people who actually chose radiation, uh, I'm sorry, the urologist chose radiation or radical prostatectomy for their patients. And the gray dots are the people who were preferred to have active surveillance or watchful waiting by the urologist. And what you can see with these box plots is if people had above median GPS scores, they were more likely to choose surgery or radiation the urologists were more likely to, to kind of lean towards active treatment. This is not really so strong in the intermediate risk where urologists more went with active treatment no matter what the GPS score did show. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the way to kind of graphically present that. We did a regression just because we went to, people just want that. This is breaking randomization now. This is just, within the GPS arm, and even more specifically to just those who received the actual asset in the GPS arm. So that limits it to 91 patients instead of the 104 randomized to that arm. And what you'd see is NCC and risk group still matters in that. Uh, and instead of GPS score itself being statistically significant, there's an interaction between GPS and the urologist baseline treatment preference. So I'm gonna show you that part now. So if the urologist initially preferred active surveillance, if you had a higher GPS score, even when you initially preferred that, urologist shifted to, to surgery or radiation. Whereas if you had your urologist prefer surgery or radiation upfront, they pretty much stayed with that and only downshifted to active surveillance three times. And it was not, what really happens is that you have to have a really low score to shift them back from active treatment to active surveillance. And so I'm going backwards here, but the education also had a borderline uh, effect meaning that people who had a high school education or more were more likely to receive active treatment with surgery or radiation. As a surgeon, I think that's because you think that they can handle it and be less likely to sue personally, but I'm not sure there's no, I have no insight into that other than what I believe happens. I think people who are maybe are undereducated are more likely not to understand or be able to deal with the complication that happens. So this is the report again for that same patient. Um, and remember, I looked at it as, as quartiles of the GPS score. So if you were in the lowest quartile, 
you're more likely to be downshifted, of course, but you also look visually like you're lower risk. And if you're in the higher quartile, we think it looks like you're at higher risk for your group. And that does pan out where only those in the lowest quartile were the urologists willing to shift back towards active surveillance. Now remember, the urologists preferred active surveillance more than 80% of the time. So it isn't like urologists were 10% choosing active surveillance, but if they were going to shift away, the assay did increase their likelihood of shifting away. So we're at a, you know, these are three academic medical centers, uh, the VA, Cook County, and UIC. So they probably are more predisposed to accepting active surveillance, but this assay may not have the effect that it's reported to have, which was to increase the use of active surveillance. I'm not sure if that's because we have a higher risk, more non-compliant population at these safety net hospitals, or if it's the assay itself is doing something unique. But um, I thought that was interesting. So my key takeaways are that active surveillance was ad uh, adoption was, was popular. It was very high overall. 83% of people actually received active surveillance. Uh, and GPS score independently increased patients and urologists preference for active treatment despite that. Higher NCT and risk group education were predictors uh, of active treatment. But I was surprised because I am a disparities researcher and my mother says everything's about race with me <laughs> because I'm a disparities researcher. Uh, but race didn't matter, age didn't matter, insurance status did not matter. Uh, in the urologist, I'm sorry, in the patient preference, it did matter. Sorry, it did not matter for urologists, it mattered for patient insurance. Uh, but comorbidity did not matter. Um, I think that the benefits in this population versus the, the kind of cohort studies that have been done in the past is really towards probably telling people who are at high risk in a non-compliant setting to go ahead and be chosen for active treatment. So the benefit is probably weighted more towards appropriate treatment for people who are at higher genomic risk. Um, so, but it still leaves the possibility that overtreatment is happening with people receiving this asset. And I think people with low, low health literacy are more prone, whether you're the patient or the provider, uh, to be shuttled towards active treatment uh, when they get this asset. Now, this is a diatribe, but when I first started my research, I was at University of Chicago uh, in my lab year from Northwestern. Um, my chair allowed me to go there for the year to start my disparities career early. And I was in the clinic and there was a guy named Dr. William Dale, the geriatrician researcher. And he was asking the men who were getting a prostate biopsy in the same clinic and competing with me for patients, uh, which I was annoyed by at the time, but he asked them, what is your risk of having cancer on, on your biopsy? And what's your risk of having an aggressive tumor? These are 70% black men on, in this University of Chicago clinic. 25% uh, of the whites thought they had 0% chance of aggressive tumors sitting there for the biopsy. And 69% of blacks thought they had 0% chance of having an aggressive tumor, despite the fact that they were getting a biopsy. So I think that low health literacy and any risk about having an aggressive disease increases a lot of people's perception of their risk of having this cancer. Now that was in 2004, but I don't think that's changed a lot from my clinical experience with patients. So what should we do differently? Uh, I think like any test we order in medicine, we should consider how the test is gonna inform your treatment decisions. Uh, and I think you, you need to know about your risk profile in your institution. At, when, in our biopsy series, um, the can, there's cancer on biopsy 55% of the time, which is much higher than what was reported in the literature before. It was about 25%. 
I'm not sure if that's because we're tertiary centers, referral centers to a degree, but uh, we have higher baseline risk at already. And so there are also a 70% black enrollment in these studies, and that's also a higher risk population. So the assay is not necessarily making people more comfortable with extra surveillance based on the risk profile of the people we are seeing. Um, and I think that this issue with low health literacy means that we should take time to allow people to make a more informed decision by bolstering their literacy before they have this conversation with their urologists. So that can be done through, you know, a, a booklet or a website or a YouTube video. Uh, someone in the audience is laughing, and I'm going to hear the comment for why that laughter is happening. Um, uh, but you could also do it with support groups. Um, you could also do it with the urologist uh, slowing down the process of just giving people a little more time to make this decision. Uh, even if it is, um, you know, 15 minute appointments, waiting three weeks or four weeks or a month in low risk prostate cancer doesn't really harm their risk of progression when the risk of death is only 3% at 10 years. So you can, you can wait. Um, and then I think insurance is an important consideration for people with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And we should encourage people even for a while to get enrolled into some kind of insurance plan to allow them to have more equitable decision-making options. So I'd like to acknowledge the Department of Defense for, for, for funding me twice. Um, they funded me five times, but twice for this cohort. Uh, I'd like to ex thank Exact Sciences, who have now sold this test to MDX Health, um, and we're, they're helping with the new study. And then, of course, the participants and the urologists and the coordinators and the people who tolerated me in the clinic and all my coordinators. Um, so I'll stop. And there's a lot of stuff in the chat, and there are people who are laughing at my presentation in the room. And so I will be glad to take uh, questions. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I don't know if, if I may. So I was Jeff Linder. I'm the chief of Helen Hormone Medicine here, and um, I was the one. That, I, I was the idiot that was laughing uh, in, in the audience. Um, I, I, I love this because this actually touches on a lot of work I do with um, uh, with decision making by patients and physicians having to do with antibiotic prescribing. And actually, just we're just had an editorial in June on Journal Medicine about how to give feedback. Uh, or rather, how not to give feedback to change behavior. So there are a lot of comments I could, I could kind of make about this. And the context of that is actually, if you go back to your what the report looks like, it's eerie. And this was a, we were writing an editorial about a paper uh, giving Swiss primary care physicians feedback about their antibiotic prescribing rates. And it kind of looked a lot like this. There's a bell curve, there's, you know, risk, uh, you know. Um, but uh, study after study shows that you give people, when you give feedback, you give way too much information. Um, and the reason I laugh during your talk is that a theme in my work is that education doesn't change decision making. So we think education is going to change, or rather, education doesn't change behavior, is what I should say. So giving people more information um, uh, doesn't necessarily change behavior. Like this is an example, you kind of got the opposite effect you were hoping for. You gave people more information and kind of made the opposite decision than you could even make. I didn't have a hope. I actually, it was really suspicious that it would lower it. That's why I did it. Right. But, the, but the rest of the population would say that it would increase active surveillance. Right. Um, so, which is really interesting because I think analogous to antibiotic, like inappropriate antibiotic prescribing in primary care clinics, the easy thing in cognitive to do for the, for the physician is active treatment or prescribing them. And any additional bit of information you get or any additional level of concern that comes up drives people's behavior toward what the clinician think the safer thing is. And they think the safer thing is, you know, why well, I better just treat them because I'm not sure. Like it's it's hard, it's cognitively harder to do active surveillance than it's sort of like we're just gonna treat. You know, the decision's done, no more, no more thinking about it. Right. So there's there's like a the fault. Uh, you know, the, the default here drives behavior. Okay. I think that 
Um, that's an interesting point because I think that uh, when you give people risk of bad news, uh, it increases people's likelihood to respond to that bad news. That's how I interpret it. But I also think that um, we're doing this follow-up study now in this trial where we look at what the patients rank as important in their treatment decision choice uh, to see if that GPS score even ranks in that top three items. I think number one is going to be the urologist's preference, right? But I wonder if it's like the MRI that they may get. Is it the uh, is it the actual assay report or not? I'm not sure what this is going to show. Um, I was just going to make a comment. You're, 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 I think you're going to walk into, and we've definitely done this again, Dr. Scott, a circumstance where it's critical to, to know and ask them what the clinician thinks the patient thinks the clinician thinks. Right? Yeah. And, and you know, it feeds into the, everything you're saying about literacy and the conversation between the yeah. most fraught, like emotional, like hard decision. Yeah. A lot of not. So this is, I mean, this is great work. <laughs> no, uh, in part, uh, I met you a few years back at, an, at a global health event, and uh, your words then actually stuck with me, which was that you were that internal medicine doctors often were worried that urologists were really trigger happy with with doing surgery or radiation, especially surgery uh, for people who have prostate cancer. I think the nice part about this study is that it says that urologists are, have come a long way uh, with being comfortable with active surveillance, uh, but that uh, all, when you present data to folks, it doesn't have the impact that you expect with education. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what's gonna happen. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll just say this is where I'll repeat it. But the, um, I'm going to restate something yet that is a slightly question. Um, so, you know, this is a high stakes decision that, that we're talking about, and we don't want to make a mistake. Uh, treat, treatment that we are called radiation or surgery, uh, failing to treat somebody with aggressive cancer is going to progress could be harmful. So, we want to take the appropriate, you know, whether it's surveillance or whether it's, it's immediate treatment. Um, so the, the purpose of incorporating more diagnostic information into the decision making is to try to uh, kind of take people from where we think, oh, you may have made an inappropriate decision to an appropriate decision. So you're, you're going to move people away um, from wherever they currently are, right? So you have, it strikes me that you have a population that 85% of which in the control group is, is like equally in the active surveillance rather than treatment. So if you're gonna move in any direction, it's gonna be probably towards treatment. So it may be because the prevailing tendency, you know, is to uh, enter active surveillance, at least in this clinical context in this population, you're not gonna be able to observe. There's sort of a ceiling over it. It's not gonna move a lot of people, the small number of proportion of people who were, you know, selected immediately by the control of 15% or for treatment, um, aren't probably going to get moved as you know as quickly as it, so the direction of movement since we're starting out with 25 percent of the most comparison to um, it, it makes sense. It stands to reason. Uh, what what I think is a little bit you know, and you brought this up a lot. What's challenging is that the health literacy in the back, right? That if we're misclassifying we're using the tool to move some people who are put in the wrong group, it shouldn't matter what the health literacy is, right? So, like, if that's if the movement is happening or the decisions are being driven by the health literacy or perceived health literacy, to me, it tends to imply that either, as Jeff points out, people don't understand the, the decision making tool or physicians having to use the tool, to look at it, and think you, you sort of that we have the biases. So, we may look at the patient and say, yeah, you know, we're not going to say this person is not, I perceive that this person is not understanding this conversation, so I'm going to bypass it. So the question is, in the trial, were you able to look, you had 10 physicians, and the patients were individually randomized. So some physicians are taking control and treatment of yeah. patients, 
Um, they're having to deliver the intervention because they may be with different fidelity to different patients based on their perception of, you know, whether it's, you know, the patient kind of scale. Um, so I guess my question is, when you uh, evaluate the fidelity of physician advice, um, when you compare physicians to use this tool, uh, did, you know, was that through like academic detailing or did you train and then observe that they did it consistently? Were you able to monitor fidelity? You know, you could tell whether they were delivered different, like you used the tool differently for people they perceive as well as they perceive. It's just a honest <laughs> and, and I do think that I will later the fact that the other explanation that points out is the patient don't understand the health of the uh, you know, you just if you know, so you know, if the tool was developed with the pre-tracking of patients that they understood the information that they were being told that it that it somehow affect their decision balance in some way that was intended, uh, or did a lot of them just sort of look at it and say, yeah, thanks, you know, and really didn't understand the, the information spoken to them. So you have four points there, and I'm trying to keep them straight. Right. Right. So I'm going to repeat the position delivered to the bare I'm going to answer four. <laughs> the first thing was that the country is at about 43% adoption of active surveillance for this. Uh, at the time, at the VA, Cook County, and, and uh, UIC, the uptake was about 12 to 30 uh, percent of active surveillance. So I think that this goes to your there's a ceiling on active surveillance it was not at all relevant or was not at all clear when we did this. I think that the assay showing one to three percent risk of metastasis and death moved the population towards more active surveillance. Actually, the opposite direction uh, than the independent effect of the assay on people. Because I think overall, it, it did increase the uptake of active surveillance for the hospitals. Um, but on a per patient basis, it had the opposite effect. That's one. The second thing that you mentioned, which I think is really kind of cool, was about the academic detailing part. We did do an, uh, a light academic detailing. We went to each site and had a PowerPoint presentation, and we required that they present it and they shouldn't even enroll people who they were not willing to present all three options, surgery, radiation, and active surveillance in that order. And they also were supposed to present the report with the three things that I star, the three things. Now, this was not tested in our trial with patients, this, asked this report. The company had come to four versions of this report since this, we started this trial in 2015. The three of them continue to have the, the same information laid out in different formats, different sizes of paper, but the same data. They added prostate cancer death and metastasis for versions two and three, of, sorry, for version three of the report, which about 20 people received. Most people received version one and, and two without the death and metastasis on there, and we did not present that data because it was almost always between one and 3% uh, to talk about that. Uh, the company has done testing on this assay. And despite the fact that urologists don't love it, patients seem to like the three pieces of data that they included. In terms, of, you talked about another part about kind of, um, kind of the ceiling. I do think that it both increased the ceiling and then decreased it within pa patient populations. There's one more part you asked me about. Yeah, whether you think um, uh, the physician delivery of this varies um, yes. you know, between individuals and the trial. In case people in the chat can't hear, which I'm not sure, um, patient, he's asking whether or not the delivery of the both the assay and the treatment counseling vary between physicians. I was only able to witness a couple of them. And I talked to the coordinators about their perceptions of different people's kind of sense. They believe that intonation of voice does play a factor in how much they emphasize those three factors. And that's why I think that we see about an 80% concordance between urologist preference and patient treatment choice. 
Um, but they were, but they did do the steps. So if I say, I think that active surveillance is a great option for many people, but for you, I think the second option may be better. Uh, and active, active treatment would be radiation, in my opinion. And here's radiation. And this is surgery, by the way. So we, we made them describe the risks and benefits of the three treatments uh, so that they could, and then we had them talk about this assay before they went over the discussion. So they kind of informed, but that's how we were required. And the question from the audience. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that what I'm saying, but. So, they should only test the order of in terms of the size of the two or do you recommend it? Um, and then, if there's another question, but some question, do you recommend one type of genomic test or another? Okay, so there are people who would argue that active surveillance genomic tests for a disease that's only 3% lethal is not a good idea. However, I'm arguing that in safety net hospitals where compliance is poor, where private insurance is 12% of the population and where health literacy is low, uh, that this assay may have a different effect than it would in a Northwestern, for example. So here, uh, you probably are gonna use it for people who have an immediate risk disease to think about whether or not they are safer or not to, to do this. And maybe people who have in a uh, low risk disease, but are on the high, like ha they have tumor in every core, for example, uh, of the biopsy. So people on the higher end of the distribution, maybe this test benefits them. But because of sampling error, uh, and because people don't show up for years with low health literacy in, in, in uh, the safety net hospitals, this actually may be a safety feature in those spaces. And then uh, I like Oncotype BX and I like the Cypher score. Both of them are well validated. Polaris is also well validated. Uh, there are two others that are less well. Uh, Decipher and Nogatype DX has race data, at least in blacks. Uh, very almost no one has any Hispanic data, despite them being 15% of the population. Um, we have a question about what is the certification on the uh, that sounds like a Scott Egner question. Uh, I, it's anonymous. If it's you, Scott, I love you. Um, but um, I think that it is a cancer. Uh, I think that it's uh, read badly in lots of centers. So that gleason three and three and gleason four are very hard to distinguish from most pathologists. Even GU pathologists only, sorry, genital urinary pathologists only agree with themselves, themselves 70% of the time. And when you look across other institutions, like County of the VA, I've done a consensus conference with Dr. Yang here and the folks at the other sites, and the initial consensus was only 65%. And then it got up to about 80% with multiple rounds of slides. So yes, Gleason 6 may not be a cancer if you have 100 people agree on that Gleason 6 tumor, but Gleason 6 is not Gleason 6 in many sites. Great, three more questions. We'll take another minute. Um, somebody did not mention what percentage of the patients were Latinos? 12%. 12% of Latinos in the population. Okay. These two questions are linked. So, do you screen your patients for emotional distress? Do you send patients to support groups? Oh, good questions. That sounds like one of my other favorite people from a us two support group um, that I told about this specifically. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, we screen them for, for emotional distress only by their facial expressions and how they sound during the meeting. Um, I've had people become tearful uh, when they hear the C word. I've had people uh, seem lost or they couldn't in interpret what I was saying. Um, it happened to me yesterday, in fact. Uh, those people, I usually have uh, additional visits with them or a family session. Uh, because I think I may be going to hell, I do it for free. It's part of my ministry. Um, it's one of my things that I believe in doing to help people kind of 
uh, have improved health literacy based off of my first paper, in fact, on this topic, because I think it matters so much. Um, and I do send them to support groups. The problem with support groups is that um, they're sometimes led by really uh, angry people who've had bad side effects from treatment. And it sometimes scares patients away from actual treatment and sends them through a scurry of second opinions. And so I will sometimes pick my favorite group leader or, or a person who's already been through it as a buddy support system versus a regular support group. Thank you so much. Thank you.